The Quarry's demo was briefly available on the Xbox Series consoles last weekend. I was lucky enough to be one of the people who had a chance to play it. So let's take a look at some of the fun stuff that you can do and find in the demo. First up, the music. It turns out that Thorn in My Side is the streaming safe track for the start of the game, not the one the developers intended for players to be hearing at the start. Likewise, the demo is not supposed to end with every little thing you do. That's just a replacement. Now, the streamer mode didn't actually work for me. My stream of the demo was immediately copyright claimed for including Thorn, but the game's not out yet. So it's entirely possible that whatever deal has been worked out with the song's publishers hasn't come into effect. As for the songs intended by the developers, they're interesting choices. When played with streamer mode off, the game opens with Moonlight by Ariana Grande and ends with the performance of Fly Me to the Moon, although tragically not Rosario Dawson's version from the film Pluto Nash. Both Moon songs, which go along with the strong werewolf vibes that float all around the game, just like the use of Blue Moon in American Werewolf in London. If Laura grabs the brochure, Max describes it as a fake kid sitting around a fake fire pit, and Laura confirms what he says, which raises the question, is he describing the poster, as I suggested in my stream? Probably not. We can see a bit of the brochure here, and we see a cartoony fire, someone chopping wood, two people in the background, the edge of the lake, and a super happy dog panting with its tongue hanging out. So no. Despite my instincts, this likely isn't a clue that everything that happens in the main game is fake. Still, it's a weird way to describe cartoons. Like, if I showed you this picture and asked you to describe it, would you say, well obviously, that's a fake clown on a fake tricycle going through a fake loop-the-loop? -loop? Probably not, right? After the crash, if Laura isn't a jerk when Max tells her not to wander off while he works on the car, instead of falling down the ravine, Max will come over and help lower Laura down so she can go looking for Eliza. Not only does this keep her from falling, but it skips a scare later on. When Laura comes running back, if she wandered off, Max isn't at the car, and when he comes back, Eliza is behind him. But if Max knows she went to look for Eliza, he just keeps working on the car and doesn't go looking for her. So when she comes back, he's there waiting for her, and the Eliza scare doesn't happen. Based on the state of the sign, and the placement of that branch, there's no way Laura could have known that it said Silas the Dog Boy. The game even confirms this if you go back and read it a second time. I played the conversation with Travis a few ways, and it always ends exactly at the same point. They're off to the quarry, with Travis following behind. One change is that if Laura doesn't fall during her sprint through the woods, she never gets her face dirty, even if she falls into the ravine. And Travis never tries to wipe it clean, skipping the flinch scene. We get a good look at one of the tarot cards in the demo. It's the Fool, and it's quite a picture. A Vardo is burning, perhaps a reference to Eliza's death. There's a face in the smoke, maybe her ghost, or another Until Dawn reference. And the Fool is headed over to help, but since he's got a leaky bucket, that's not going to work out for anyone. Some people have said this looks like a drawing of Mike from Until Dawn, and suggested that the other people in various tarot cards might feature references to other Supermassive Games characters. I can kind of see what they're talking about, but I'm terrible at recognizing faces, so I can't really speak to this. Once we get a few more cards, we can see if that's what's going on. We also now know where the Rod Serling sound like is going to be in the game. I'd assume that they were going to have a fake episode of The Twilight Zone in the background of a scene or two, but no! Rod Serling hosts the game's tutorials, which are animated sequences that explain the game's various systems. Only two of them appear in the demo, but both are delightfully silly. Now, this is the same actor who did Rod Serling's voice in the Twilight Zone revival from a couple of years ago, and he does a pretty good job of mimicking Serling's tone and delivery. When they get to the lodge, Laura can knock again instead of immediately giving up, which is nice, although it's a little strange that she doesn't notice that a light was turned on inside the lodge the minute she's done knocking. You just found someone, Laura. Pay attention. Seriously, though, who's inside the lodge? It's not Travis. Is it Chris, and he's not a monster, but just watching over the locked up monsters? Did he call Travis when he heard the Range Rover drive up? Laura can also walk to the end of the porch and peek in a window, where we can see a leather-bound book and what seems to be the planchette for a Ouija board. Is Chris trying to communicate with spirits? Will it go better than it did for the Chris in Until Dawn? Or is this just a reference to that? There's no way to leave the lodge other than by going into the storm shelter. Walking him to the car just leads to a line with Max, and the gate is closed behind them. Which is a pretty weird thing to have done after driving up, actually. This description of the bloody collar in the basement backs up my theory that it was on a person. 
We're told it's too big for a dog and that Tim would be a strange name for one anyway. Did someone label the collars on the various prisoners? Because once they transform into monsters, it's difficult to tell them apart? That would be bleak. By turning up the brightness on the game, we're able to get a better look at the monster, seeing its long claws and dog-like snout. The snout isn't really visible in this shot, however, although that could just be the angle of its head. If we look at a frame-by-frame frame of Max getting tackled, we can see that the beast jumps past Max and grabs his head with both of its hands, dragging him to the ground. No biting of any kind. In this frame, we can see its ribs, with the skin pulled tight against them, as if it's a huge, starving creature, creating some Wendigo vibes there. There's an image going around of what the monster's model looks like. I don't know if it's real, and I'm not going to show it here. While I'm fine changing the brightness and digging into the corners of the demo, I'm not going to show any footage purported to be extracted from the game's files before the game comes out. That's too deep into spoilers for me. At the ending, I did all of the possible variations. Help Max, don't help Max, don't decide. And there's no additional scenes. Travis shows up and shoots, then says his line no matter what. The only weird one is the don't do anything, which just leaves Laura crouched near Max before Travis shoots. We hear a monster attack and screams, but Laura doesn't react at all? Which seems pretty strange visually. We already knew that bearings in this game were going to be called paths, but now we've found out that those paths are represented by videotapes, each one with a custom cover. The two we've seen are both about Travis, one with him looking scary, and the other with him locking Laura and Max up. And the description of that one suggests that they might both be able to survive the prologue. Extra neat is the fact that we can see all of the steps of the path represented as tape. Presumably, as we select the different parts of the path by pushing left and right, the tape will spool from the left to the right side, representing that we're getting further into the movie. That is a nice touch. Now let's talk about a couple of fun technical things I noticed in the demo. First off, the tumble down the ravine has been fixed. Laura is no longer hovering in midair before she slips. While making a lens flare, something went awry, and instead of simply reflecting light to the left side of the screen, the game reflects a whole image of Laura's hand holding her phone. In the video about making the Travis scene, we're told that when they had Ted Rainey sit down in a chair to get the motion tracking of him getting into the cop car, they'd had him sit way too high, so they had to cheat it down a few feet and move him through the floor of the car model. You can actually see this happen in the game when, as Ted is getting into the cruiser, his head drops two feet straight down when he's midway into climbing into the car. If Laura's eye is this close to the storm doors, she would have had to have taken her hat off, but she doesn't, meaning that just off screen the hat is clipping right into the metal. When looking at the game's menus, this light to the right of Laura's head makes it hard to read any words directly in front of it. Hopefully they will remove the light, and I really hope other characters don't have similar issues. The menu for showing how subtitles will look is great, especially since it uses the current line the character is saying to demonstrate the effect. This creates one problem, though. In the main menu at the start of the game, there isn't a line queued up, so anyone who wants to set the subtitle options before they start the game will have no idea what their choices look like. Hopefully they can add in a, this is sample text to this screen in the finished game. This isn't a glitch, but by turning up the brightness, I got a good look at this child's bike in the bunker, and I don't know why, but I find the spinning wheel super creepy. Here's the theme from Nightmare on Elm Street. Here's the main menu theme from The Quarry. That is audacious. Can they get away with a reference that close? So that's it for things I noticed in the demo. Overall, it's a fantastic prologue, maybe Supermassive Games' best one ever. And the way it tells a complete story with a dynamite cliffhanger ensures that it works great as an enticement to play the rest of the game. Which, obviously, I can't wait to do.
I've been the Hidden Object Guru. Thanks for watching. If you haven't yet, please like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, consider checking out our Patreon. You can join heroic patrons like Marissa, Joanne, Eduardo, Brian, and Archer in helping keep the lights on around here. If you'd like to see more, there's nightly streams and plenty of videos to check out. We'll see you back here for the next thing, but until then, au revoir.